class turn to number 406. 406. Have to use your books. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a God's celestial shore. I'll Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that for allowing us to come in midweek and study from your word. We thank you for the home that you have promised to us if we faithfully live and do your will. Father, we pray that you'll strengthen us to always be faithful in your sight and in accordance with your word. Father, we also pray for our nation. We pray that you'll be with our nation, especially with the uh, leaders of this nation as they try to steer us back to your ways. And Father, we pray that they'll be successful and that you'll bless them in the, those efforts, especially the ones that are coming up in this coming week. Father, we thank you for our elders here at Bremen and we pray that you'll bless them and strengthen them. And we pray that you will also be with our deacons. Father, thank you for our teacher that's come today and we pray that you'll bless him with the remembrance of those things that he's prepared for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good evening. So thankful to welcome a good crowd here this evening for our midweek Bible study and continuation of our summer series. We do have visitors among us. We are so thankful that you're here and invite you back anytime you can be with us here at Bremen. Let's dismiss our classes now. Nursery, preschool, kindergarten, and elementary school. My privilege to introduce our summer series speaker this evening. Brother Joe Engelbird comes to us from just down the road at the West Georgia Congregation. He is no stranger to us in this area, and we are thankful for the opportunities we've had to work with him. Specifically, Joe was the brand new first year chef at Camp Inigahi this year, and we all gained weight during camp, even though we were out running around. He took care of us very well. He is an excellent Bible scholar, and we are certainly thankful to have him. Looking forward to what he has to tell us this evening in our summer series. Joe?
what uh, Johnny doesn't know is that, and what most of you may not know is that, I thought I would enjoy camp. I, I went to camp when I was little I, for several years. Uh, and I thought this would be fun, you know, it would be a great week away from the, the, the day to day. <clears throat> I loved it. I'm going to tell you, I loved it. And uh, I'd be there every week if I could, you know. If, if I, if I could figure out a way to, to not have to be paid to work, I would just go to camp all week and cook and enjoy the fellowship, the great lessons. I had a great time out there and look forward to uh, many, many more of those years to come. Uh, you know, my kids are little. Y'all saw them. They're a little bitty. So, and they'll be out there until I'm 110 years old. So I got a long time to work out there, and I'm thrilled at the opportunity uh, for the opportunity to utilize those skills that I have for the kingdom. I really am. Uh, so I appreciate that. I also appreciate uh, very much uh, the elders here at Bremen uh, for uh, the foresight they have to put together a summer series to encourage you and encourage me. I appreciate that very much. Uh, and also for the uh, opportunity to be uh, one, of the, one of the speakers on the summer series. I don't know. I don't know who else were your speakers, but I, you know, uh, uh, I have not uh, endeavored to go to preaching school, so I don't, I don't know if that gets me a letter grade cut already from the grades you might give me for speaking, but please don't hold it against me since I'm not some sort of trained preacher. I spend a lot of time in the kitchen, so, uh, but I love to do it nonetheless. I don't think that's, there's nothing wrong with that. I just, uh, but I certainly appreciate the opportunity to share this lesson with you and Chad extending the invitation. Uh, it's great to be able to be here. He uh, assigned to me, or I, he gave me several topics, and we picked for the topic for this evening, Waters from the Rock at Rephidim. And it's from the book of Exodus chapter 17, and it's only seven verses. So what I thought we would do is uh, to read through those seven verses and to go back through and to examine those verses and to see what exactly it is that we can, we can ascertain and glean from this incident concerning God and His children uh, in the wilderness. If you'll read with me, I'll just read quickly through Exodus chapter 17, verses 1 to 7, and then we'll proceed with uh, looking at it uh, a little more closely. And the Bible says this, And then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandments of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me, and why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted for water there, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it you brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people of, and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand your rod with which you struck the river and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb and you shall strike the rock and water will come out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? When I began to study through this, I realized that, that one of the most astounding verses in all the Bible is contained in Exodus chapter 17 and verse 1. Something is contained in Exodus 17 verse 1 that, that if you read throughout the Scripture, you, you rarely find. Notice what it is. In verse 1 of Exodus 17 all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin according to the commandment of the Lord. In all of your Bible studies and all the things that you have uh, learned through the years as you have endeavored to study the Bible, how often does the Bible say, all obeyed the Lord? How many times is that noted? That's rare, isn't it? Uh, and I was trying to think, I, di I didn't in put a, a lot of thought into it or a lot of deep study into trying to figure out how many times the Bible might have said that. It did strike me that there was at least one other occurrence, one other time that we could look to and see where all obeyed the Lord. And that would have been 
Adam and Eve before they sinned, wouldn't it? But all was two people there. And all here is how many people? Perhaps millions. And I thought that was noteworthy because it points out something that's so often seen in the Scripture and perhaps sometimes, unfortunately, we see it within the church too. On the heels of these people, all these folks, all the children of God obeying God, what happened next? It, it went awry. Look there, if you will, at the, at the rest of verse uh, number 1 and see what the Bible says there. All the people obeyed God. All the people were doing what God said. But there was no water for the people to drink. There was no water for the people to drink. Now, uh, you and I know, and you and I having studied through the Bible and many lessons before, would agree that, the, that God never includes anything in His Word accidentally. There's just no room for fluff in the Bible. So it's very interesting to me how it vividly points out and there was no water for them to drink. So why do you think that is? Why do you think it is that there was no water for these people to drink? Or well, one of the things we might think about is it's for a test. We can learn in other places that it was just for that reason. It was for a test. But I want you to think about this. Where had the people of God, the nation of Israel, where had they been living for the past, say, 430 years? In Egypt, in, in particular, the a region of Goshen. Was that a fertile region? Is that a place where they could uh, raise a family and have their livestock? And these things? They didn't worry about water in this place, did they? And so for centuries, they had been well cared for by God. Even as they exited uh, Egypt through uh, the Red Sea on dry land, all the way to where they are now in Rephidim, had God not cared for them and provided for them. There's an incident over in Exodus chapter 15 where that, that they were in a place and the water was bitter. You recall that? You may have even studied through that in, in this summer series about water. And the water was bitter there and Moses was instructed to do what? Put a, put a branch or a tree or some kind of thing down in the water and it became sweet. You recall that incident? Did God not provide for them there? So for decades, God had been providing for them and now there's no water for the people to drink. The people are being faced with a test and they know, they know as well as you and I know, do, does the physical body, the you and I in the physical form, require water to live? Say we do. Absolutely. How long can you and I live without water. Anybody know the answer to that question? It didn't long, is it? Two, three days at the most, and then, then, then life begins to wane if you don't get some sort of hydration in the body. There, there are people who engage in these sort of, the, these activities where they go out and do a lot of endurance type sports, and they have what's called in those endurance type sports, those endurance games, the rule of the threes. And one of the rules of threes is you can only live about three days without water. And so let's think about this a minute. Did God, does God, who created these people and put them there and, and made them His people and, and, and took care of them from the land of Goshen on through where they are now in Rephidim for 430 years and even way prior to that, does He not know they need water? You think God just, uh, whoa, made a mistake sending them this way, they, there's no water there. Now, you and I know that God doesn't do things like that. God does things on purpose. Notice with me an incident that happened in Exodus chapter 16. And there, the people cried out because they didn't have anything to eat. And they complained to Moses that, you've brought us out of Egypt, kill us with hunger. Back in Egypt, we had everything we needed to eat. We had bread and to the full, we had meat. And we had all these great things, but in Exodus 16 and verse number 4, the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day. What for? What does it say there? That I might test them whether they will walk in my law or not. 
So did God utilize food and water to test his people in this wilderness? You say, of course he did. Why? Because he wanted to see if they were true to him or would be true to him or not. In the book of Deuteronomy, turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8. And this shares some commentary on the very thing we're reading from Exodus. In Deuteronomy 8, in verse number 3, Moses said, So he, that would be God, humbled you and allowed you to hunger. You ever been hungry? You ever been hungry on purpose? You know, we live in a time when, it, when it, it's popular for people to say, you know, uh, if, if you have faith in God, if you believe in God, God's going to bless you. God's going to give you, uh, you know, a, a, a Maserati. That's what I've always wanted, a Maserati. I don't know anything about a Maserati, but I know that sounds cool. So if I have faith in God, I'm going to get a Maserati. I'm going to get a house on the hill, and I'm going to have so much food. I'm just going to, I'm just going to sit there and eat till, till, till I can't eat anymore. But here... In this occasion, God allowed His people not only to hunger, but to thirst. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine God doing something like that today? You think God would do something like that today? Imagine the attitude of these people, His, his children, uh, the children of Israel. Here they are, having been taken care of by God all these years, and all of a sudden there's no water for them to drink. What point is God trying to make to these people? What is he trying to draw out of them? Depend on him. Paul made a point in the book of Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, and in paraphrase he said this, there are people who are out there, he warned the church at Philippi that there are people walking about you who are the enemies of the cross of Christ. You've read that passage. And then following that, he describes these people as people whose God is their belly. The, the people who are enemies of God have as their God their belly, their appetites, their wants, and their desires. Somebody said, Joe, but yeah, we need water. You got to eat. You need water. But what did God require more than to satisfy that physical need? To obey Him. So God set out to test His children in this wilderness whether they would obey His law or whether they would not. And something that came to mind, this may be a, a flippant point, but it, I thought about it several times as I studied through this. You know, sometimes we are chided by the denomination folks in the denominations around us saying, you know, what if somebody wants to be baptized and there's just no water? This must have been that one place in the world where there was no water for somebody to be baptized. Now, I'm jesting about that, of course, because if there are people in the physical form that are going to live and to subsist where they need water. And so what should the nation of Israel, these people who had been uh, 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 provided for so richly by God for decades and centuries, what ought they have thought? What should have been at the forefront of their thinking when they got to this place and there was no water? Did, did you notice what they did think? Did you notice what they said to Moses? God's brought us out here to kill us. Can you hear it? Do you know people like that where you live? Oh, it's terrible. I don't know how we're ever going to live. Do you know people who talk like that when things get, when the going gets tough, they get gone? That's what it seems like. Why is it that they didn't think to themselves or why some of, and maybe they did, I don't know, it doesn't say, but why didn't some of the, the common sense folk there among that crowd say, you know, think about this a little bit. Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers, wound up in Potiphar's house, and became second in command behind Pharaoh in Egypt. And there, there, there was a famine. And all of our forefathers, this bunch had to come over to Egypt to get food. And they realized when it was Joseph that this is the one who they thought they had killed and and what did Joseph say to them? You know, the things you meant for evil? The things you meant to do to harm me, Joseph said to his brothers there? God meant it for good. When God allowed Joseph to suffer these things at the hand of his brothers, and he rose to prominence in the land of Egypt, 
and this heathen government, you might say. It was the providence of God through all of that to do what? To provide for His people. Why didn't somebody in Exodus 17 pipe up and say that? God has always provided for us. And then, when we came to Egypt, we got the choicest land of Goshen to live in. A place where we never wanted for anything. Was there one single person in this whole congregation here that, that thought, you know, I've heard these stories of Joseph and all the great things that happened because jo of the blessings that Joseph was to us. Why didn't somebody stand up and say, you know, You've heard the story of Abraham, have you not? Where God came to Abraham, Genesis chapter 22, and said, Abraham, I know you love your son Isaac, but what I want you to do is rise up and take him to Mount Moriah and sacrifice him to me. Verse number 14 of that passage says this, that Isaac said to Abraham, well, we've got the fire, we've got the wood, all these things for the sacrifice, but... Where's the lamb? What did Abraham say to him? God will provide. Did nobody in this congregation in Exodus 17 think God will provide? Isn't that the singular thing that God has encouraged us and wanted us from day one to have at the forefront of our mind? If it looks like there's no way, then God will provide. Did God provide for Abraham on that occasion? He did. So they could think about Joseph that God provided for them. All the way through the land where they went through a place called, uh, they went through a place called Elam. What was in Elam? Fountains and palm trees for them to drink of and to sit under the shade of those trees. And all that time God had provided for him, provided for Abraham. You know, the Hebrews writer comments on this thing in, in Hebrews chapter 11 that Abraham's faith was so strong in God that he had concluded that if he had went through with killing Isaac that God was able to do what? Raise him up. Tremendous faith in this man Abraham who these people in Exodus 17 should have looked back to and said, I'm going to be like Abraham. I'm going to be like Joseph who didn't falter but was faithful. And God provided for them every single step of the way. And you could look at just the recent history. They're not two or three months out of Egypt at this point in Exodus 17. Do they not remember the plagues? How about the one where God killed the firstborn of every house that didn't have the blood applied? Did they not remember those things that God provided for them so richly? One of my very favorite passages is found in the book of Lamentations, chapter 3. And we have a song that's written about this passage. And it says that every morning God's mercies are new. Great is what? Say it. Thy faithfulness. Does God ever look down at His people and say, yeah, they need this, but I'm busy. I know that they want this or need this and they have to have this and you know, I'm the one who can give it to them, but I'll get to them later. God always hears and God always provides. That's the message that the children of Israel in Exodus 17 ought to have known. And that's the message we should know and take forward throughout the rest of our lives. We sing a song with our young folks. We had our VBS last week, same week as y'all, and we focused on singing the entire week. One of the songs that we looked at and studied about was Be Careful Little Eyes. Be careful little hands. Wouldn't it have been appropriate for this congregation in the wilderness here to say, be careful little minds? Because when one person gets this idea that God's left us, God's not going to provide for us, we, He's brought us out here to die, then it infects people, doesn't it? You ever seen negativity spread like a wildfire through a group of people? It's called the mob mentality. Paul comments on this situation or the situation of the people in, in the wilderness in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 where he says with many of them he was not well pleased. And what I take to mean, there were some who were faithful to God. 
There were some, perhaps, who even thought of Joseph and Abraham and, and the faithful that they could draw strength from and see that God had provided for. And they should have said to those others, be careful what you think. Because you can talk yourself right out of faithfulness if you're not careful. So this passage where we're studying about the water from the rock leaves us with a great many lessons on faithfulness. But instead of looking back and gaining faith and building faith and just saying, that God's going to provide for us. I don't know how. I don't know, what, I don't know what's going to happen, but God will provide for us. Instead, they became faithless rather than becoming faithful on this occasion. Look what it says there in, in verse number 2 of Exodus 17. Therefore the people contended with Moses. Give us water that we may drink. Why do you contend with me, Moses said, and why do you tempt the Lord? Faithless. On, an, on another, there's another verse there, verse number 7, where they concluded, is the Lord even among us? Have you ever wondered, and I wonder this a lot, and, and, and I know we have the benefit of hindsight and we have the Scripture to read and to learn from. If you'd been in that group, what would you have thought? Because I, I, and, and I, don't, mean to, I don't mean anything by this other than did, did they not remember the things they had just seen? Do they not remember that God had just given them manna? He had saved all in their... Do they not know these things? And yet they say, is God among us? Is God, where's God? It just, seems, it just seems incredible that they had went from all the congregation obeyed in verse 1 to verse number 7. Is God even here? Where's God? We're out here by ourselves. We're going to die. And that's not what God wants from them or wanted from them, and that's certainly not what He wants from us. And you can look throughout the Scripture in a number of places, this wandering in the wilderness, this, this argumentative nature between the children of Israel and God becomes a narrative throughout all of the Scripture to point out faithlessness in Ezekiel chapter 20. In verse 13, Ezekiel there notes that Israel rebelled against me. How'd you like to have that tag on your head? Stephen, as he preached in Acts chapter 7, said, our fathers wouldn't obey God. I would not want that on my account. And as we pointed out just, just a bit ago, Paul, as he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, said that with many of them he was not well pleased. Instead of becoming faithful, they became faithless. But all the while, God had intentions to, to provide for them the things that they needed. In Exodus chapter 17, in verse number 6, God says to Moses, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it that the people may drink. You read that and you know, that's exactly what I would expect God to do. Provide somehow water for the people to drink. Turn over in your Bibles to, to the book of Psalms. Because the psalmist has some commentary on this, on this occasion, on this thing. And in Psalms chapter 78, we, learn, uh, we, we gain a little insight regarding this water. In Psalm chapter 78, verses 15 and verse 16... Notice what is said here about this occasion. He split the rocks, verse 15, in the wilderness and gave them drink in abundance like the depths. Can you recall another time where the depths were broken open? What happened then? <laughs> the flood of the whole world. So when, when Moses did as the Lord commanded in Exodus 17 and struck that rock, did it trickle out? <laughs> Was it just a little old stream? I've been, many years ago, when I was little, I'd go out in the woods, you know, walk around. I don't do that stuff much anymore, you know. But anyway, back then, there were creeks everywhere around where we lived. And some were just a little old trickle. It wouldn't give anybody any amount of water. But what does the psalmist say about this? It was like the depths. And verse 16, he also brought streams out of the rock and caused 
waters to run down like rivers. When God provided for the children of Israel in Exodus 17 by having Moses strike that rock, He wasn't just giving them a little trickle. He gave them water in abundance to drink. Exodus chapter 12 notes that there were 600,000 men, not counting the children, doesn't say anything there about the women. And some estimate that there could have been up to four, maybe six million people in this caravan as they marched into the wilderness. Can you imagine how much, how much water is required for this group of people in this room every day? How much do you reckon? A thousand gallons? 10,000 gallons? I don't know. I'm making it up. How much water would be required for a number like this? 600,000? Oh, 5 million? Whatever it might be. How much water did God need to give them? Water like rivers. Water out of the depths. See, when God does it and God provides, it is sufficient for everybody. In Deuteronomy 28, there's another sort of... <clears throat> it's necessary to want to think about these things and to read them. And this has to do with some... Maybe a little, a little bit different of a time, but it has to do with the same principle that God will provide for those people who do what He says. Read with me here in Deuteronomy 28 just a little bit. Now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all of His commands which I command you today that the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. Blessed shall you be in the city and blessed shall you be in the country. Blessed shall be the fruit of your body, the produce of your ground, the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, the offspring of your flocks. Blessed shall be the basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. God is looking for a people who will obey Him. Full stop. Not question, not what if. Oh, what, oh, what are we going to do? That is not in God's vocabulary. What are we going to do now? Based on what we can learn from these passages we've just sort of cobbled together to look at this, the nation of Israel should have stood still and waited on God to do what God was going to do because God was going to provide for them because God pointed out, well, there was no water for the people to drink. I can just see I'm going to give you water. Can you see it? Do, do, we understand that much at least about the character and nature of God that He is going to give everything that we require and provide for us our, our needs. If they hadn't had water for three or four days, most of these people would have likely died. If they hadn't had water for a week, there would have been no children of Israel. And that wasn't in God's plan, was it? There was a plan for these people and they should have known it. And God was going to provide for them everything that they needed. So we may ask, well, what does water in this passage represent? To Israel, it meant a link between life and death in the physical body. They knew that if they didn't get water and fast, that they were going to begin to die quickly and ugly death. I was, every story that I see on a news site or wherever about food or nutrition, I almost have to go and read it because that's the kind of stuff that I do. I was reading just the other day about a, a, some movie that's being filmed. Don't know what the movie is, doesn't matter. But part of the, part of the movie, part of the, the, the thing they were shooting was a scene where the people in this particular time period were starving. Starvation. They were trying to film that. And one of the lead actors commented that they had the people that were a part of the shooting the scene, the actors, had lived for many weeks eating only three to four or five hundred calories a day. Now, for most people, a big fellow like me, I can get upwards to three or four thousand calories and still be looking for stuff to eat. I like to eat. That's why I cook, because <laughs> I like to eat. I never am without a meal. 
But they had purposefully, for the purposes of their work, this movie, eaten only four or five hundred calories a day for many weeks. And the commentary from this particular actor was, all I could think about was food. When you don't have those things that stand between you and death, food and water, the mind becomes consumed with getting them. The mind becomes focused on getting them. And, and there are certain cases and instances where people do uh, very bad things in order to obtain the food and water they think they need to survive. So for Israel on this occasion, water stood between them and physical death. For God, what did the water represent? A test. I remember from Deuteronomy 8 and verse 3, He said, God caused you on purpose to hunger that He might know if you were going to be faithful. And what does water represent to us? How do these things relate from Exodus 17 to you and I as the Lord's church? You no doubt have already thought in your mind of John chapter 4 and verse 14, Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well. What did Jesus say to her? If you're really thirsty, if you really need some water, you would have asked of me and I would have given you that water where if you drink it, you'll never thirst again. See, the implication that, that we can draw from Exodus 17, verses 1 to 7, is that Israel needed physical water. God used water as a test for the nation of Israel. And if we don't drink of the life-giving water that Christ gives, then we'll have no life eternal. We'll have none of it. So for our learning when we try and, uh, and ascertain the principles talked about here in Exodus 17, what are some things that we can glean from the way the children of Israel reacted to God on this occasion and things we can learn from the, the things that are written here? If you will, Hebrews chapter 3. I'm just going to read these and let the Bible say them. Hebrews chapter 3, beginning with verse number 8. Do not harden your hearts as in the day, as in the rebellion, in the day of trial in the wilderness. That ring a bell? Verse number nine, where your fathers tested me, tried me, and saw my works. Forty years. Therefore I was angry with that generation and said, they always go astray in their hearts, and they have not known my ways. So I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest. And the Hebrews writer goes on there saying, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. What do we learn from Exodus chapter 17? That the nation of Israel had a choice to make. What they should have done is stuck with what they were doing in verse number 1. All obeyed. But there was verse 2, and they began to complain. And they began to murmur, and they began to chide Moses, and they began to question whether God was really on their side. And the Hebrews writer implores us that we not make that same mistake, that we stay faithful. We realize that no matter what circumstance might look like in our world, and I appreciate the prayer uh, just a moment ago as we opened our class, but we look up in our country today, and we're, we may have, have this tendency to think, oh, it's over. Uh, no, it's not, <laughs> because we're not serving the United States of America. As much as I love this country, I do. I want my children to grow up in the freedoms that, that we've been afforded. But God will provide for His people, no matter what it's like in this country. And so maybe that's one of the lessons we can take from Exodus 17. There's another thing that we can think about that we've already referenced a couple of times from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Turn there with me and let's just let the Bible say it. Let's let Paul explain it. In verse number 5 and verse number 6, Paul said, But with most of them God was not well pleased, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things, what things? Exodus 17, 
complaining against God, disobeying God, all the things that we read of through the history of the children of Israel, these things became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. The message that God was trying to, the principle that God was trying to instill in His people in Exodus 17 is the very principle that He's trying to instill in us today. Be faithful to me, I will provide for you. I had for many years uh, talked about, many of maybe you and I have talked about uh, and read about and thought about God's providence. And sometimes, I don't know if you're like me, but you know, the, what does God's providence look like? What does God do to providentially provide for His people? Then it dawned on me one day, I've been saying that word wrong. Providence may be one of the ways to say it, but it struck me that that word is providence. God always provides, doesn't He? Can you think of a time in your life that God didn't provide for you all that you needed? <laughs> your cup and my cup have always overflowed. Isn't that right? In this nation, the, the children of Israel in Exodus 17, their cup was, if they just had waited, their cup would have been overflowing with the things they needed. Hebrews chapter 3 warns us not to be like them. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 warns us not to be like them. But then there's Matthew 6. And to me, this may well be the, the parallel passage to Exodus 17. In Matthew 6, Jesus is preaching His Sermon on the Mount. And in verses 31 through 34, there are some things that Jesus says that when you read them and just read over them, you, it, it's maybe easy to miss. But go back and read this and think about what Jesus is saying here in verse 31 beginning. Therefore do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Answer me this question. How many people in this world are tied up and consumed with what they will eat every day? I'm not talking about the starving people in this world. I'm talking about the people like you and I who are affluent, going, well, I want this today, or I want that today. And my whole mind is consumed with what will I eat, or what will I drink, or what am I going to wear? You know, when I was getting ready to come over here, I put on several different outfits and had Jennifer. <laughs> Does that one look right? <laughs> No, that doesn't go with that. See, I'm, if it weren't for my sweet wife, I'd still be wearing flannel and ripped torn jeans. That's all. I wouldn't have a, a nice looking outfit to wear, but it's because of her I do. But the world is just consumed. What am I going to wear today? What am I going to eat? You ever heard of this thing called Twitter or Facebook? It's full of people. Look what I'm eating. I'm having cheesecake today. I'm not supposed to, but I'm having it anyway. You know people like that on your social media. It just blows me away. I don't care what you eat. I don't mean that ugly. I just don't care what you're eating. Because what I'm eating might be better. No, I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. But, but notice what Jesus says. Don't worry about what you eat. Don't worry about what you drink. And don't worry about what you wear. Now stop with me and consider what Jesus is saying there. Here we have the words of our Creator. John chapter 1. Here we have the words of the individual who without, nothing was made. Does he not know that the physical body needs food? And water? And clothing? He knows that. But what is he saying? He's trying to instill in you and I the same attitude that God wanted from His people in Exodus 17. Notice what he goes on to say. For after all these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. See? God knows what we need. And the very next phrase, but seek second. Is that what he said? Third. When you get around to it, seek, the kingdom. seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Could that same verse have been spoken in Exodus 17? It is in so many words, isn't it? In so many words, God said to them, if you would just listen to me, if you would just be faithful to me, 
If you would just wait on me, Isaiah said, and, and I don't know the verse in the chapter or whatever, but he said, if you'll wait on the Lord, you'll mount up with wings like eagles. Didn't he say that? If we would just wait. And that's a great passage there in Matthew 6. There are several other things. I hope we get to them. John 6, where Jesus feeds the 5,000. John's account of it. He feeds the 5,000 with a uh, couple of fishes and some barley loaves. All these 5,000 people. And his disciples say, well, this ain't enough food for a boy. This is a boy's lunch. How are we going to feed all these people? And how many baskets of fragments did they take up? Twelve? So what does that point out? God in his providence will always give us more than we need, as much or more than we need. He would have done that in Exodus 17, and he will do that for us today. Matthew chapter 10, 29 through 31 it's a great passage there where it's talking about where God, you know, about the sparrows. Are not two sparrows so for a copper coin and not one of them falls to the ground apart from your father's will. The very hairs of your head are numbered. Do not fear, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Does God regard his creation the sparrow? Sure. It's a great, it's a beautiful bird, I'm sure. I don't know if I've ever seen one, but I'm sure if God made it, it's good. He said so. It's very good, very good. But guess what your soul and my soul are worth? Much more than sparrows. Much more than many sparrows. So God will provide for us. And on we could go, but we need to finish on this point, because that, that bell must mean we're, I'm about to get the cane. <laughs> and they're going to yank me off. This point needs to be made, though. That God instructed Moses to strike the rock and water would come forth. Strike the rock, Moses, and you'll have all the water that you need. You'll, you'll be saved if you strike the rock. Your lives will be preserved if you strike the rock. 1 Corinthians 10, and we have referenced that passage a number of times, refers to the rock that they all drank from in the wilderness. And that rock was Christ. So hold that point. In John chapter 4 and verse 14, what did we mention a minute ago? The water that Christ will give us will satisfy our spiritual thirst eternally. So the rock that provides the living water, God struck. Turn with me, if you will, to John chapter 19. John 19, verses 17 and 18. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two others with him on either side, and Jesus in the center. In John chapter 34, you know what that says, I know. That's, that centurion came forth and, and pierced the side of Jesus. And immediately what came out? Blood and water. Isaiah in Isaiah 53 in verse number 4 says that Christ was smitten of God. In verse number 5, he was wounded and he was bruised. And in verse number 10, Isaiah says this, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Brothers and sisters, there was a time when God told Moses to strike the rock because it would provide water to sustain the physical lives of the children of Israel. But there's a day in history, the day that Jesus went to the cross where God stood forth and struck the rock of ages, and the life-giving blood flowed out that will give you and I life forever. And I think when we look at Exodus 17, that's the takeaway message. Because how is it that we obtain that blood? How is it we contact that blood? Same way they would have gotten that water if they had waited. Obey God. And that water, that blood will cover us when we obey His gospel. Any questions, comments, input, output, criticism? 
that about the time? About the time. Good. I so much appreciate your opportunity, the opportunity to speak, and evidently my time is expired. Man, That's I appreciate great. that. Appreciate that. Oh, That's great. Good very. preparation. Yeah, Good thank you very much. You lived very well. I appreciate, well. I appreciate the invitation, man. Yeah. I tell you, that means a lot to me. Yeah. It really does. And now everybody knows that. <laughs>
It's time for us to begin or continue. Brother Chris is out of town, Brother Jacob is out of town, so they're bringing in the third string. <laughs> for prayer list updates, just uh, see the, uh, our screen and also the bulletin for those who are on our prayer list, and you'll uh, receive updates for those. Keep those people in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, so ju just a few area events, or, or our events, we want to announce first, and then a couple of area events. Uh, we, we are going to host the area-wide singing here at Bremen this coming Friday night. This will be at 7 o'clock. Please bring finger foods to help feed our visitors afterward. That's this Friday night at 7 o'clock. There's also a sign-up sheet in the foyer for the Ladies' Day in September. This is for breakfast for the Ladies' Day, correct? So that'll be to provide breakfast. So there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer. That's for our Ladies' Day coming up in September. And then area events, Rock Mart's going to have a VBS August 2nd through the 6th at 7 p.m. each night. Bowden is going to have their annual gospel meeting August 2nd through 6th also. B.J. Clark will be the speaker for that. Uh, for any other details concerning other area events, just see the bulletin and or the bulletin board. By the way, the invitation song has been changed, so make sure you mark number 672. This is something Joe's requesting to go along with his material. All right, so that'll, that'll be our invitation song. I know we had another one, but that's, uh, and you said Brian has that, right? Number 672, that'll be the invitation song. No other announcements. I'm going to turn it over to Brother Joe for the invitation. You hear me? You hear me now? There you go. We looked at uh, tonight in the lesson regarding the water from the rock at Rephidim, a statement made by the children of Israel in verse number 7 of Exodus chapter 17. And for some reasons that may seem outlandish, given all the things that they had seen in the recent past and in the history of, of their own people, they concluded and asked the question of Moses, is the Lord among us or not? Where is God? We're out here about to thirst to death, and where is God? can't be found. We need Him, and He can't be found. In Psalm 78, talking about this same incident or a similar incident, the psalmist comments on this saying that the children of Israel even went so far as to ask, can God even set a table in the wilderness for us to sustain ourselves? Is God even able to do what He says He will do? you imagine the audacity of a people who are supposed to be the people of God to make such a statement? Is God here or not? And if He is here, can He even do anything to help us? Those are strong words. Strong words for the people who should be and or were called the children of Israel, God's own people. But there are people who walk around in our own day and time and ask the question, is there even a God? Looking out at the great and wonderful creation, the, the, the sky, the trees, the moon, the stars, and all these things, and they conclude to themselves, <clears throat> there's no God. No, these things just happened. It's just uh, by chance that these things are here. Totally missing the fact that there is a God in heaven, our Creator. And that He is alive, we sing that song we're about to sing. There is a God and He is alive. And one of those things that we sing in that song, teaching and, and admonishing one another, is, the, is this. In Him we live and we survive. The question before every person, at least one point in their lives, are you in Him or are you out of Him? There's only two places really to be, aren't there? There's no straddling the fence with God. Uh, there, the idea that Jesus gave about lukewarmness and revelation, there is no such thing because those who are lukewarm are on the wrong side of the fence. So when you ask the question, is there a God? Yes, there is a God and He is alive and in Him is where we live. We talked about from John chapter 4 and verse 14, the living water. We looked at John 19 where that Jesus was on the cross and as it were, God struck him and, 
In a sense, that's what happened. God struck him and forth came blood and water. Life-giving blood. Are you washed in that blood? Have you been baptized into Christ where your sins are forgiven to rise to walk in a new life? Do you believe that Jesus is the Christ? Have you heard the message of the Gospel? You know, if you've heard the message of the Gospel, then a seed has been planted. Has that seed grown? Has it grown to maturity and you've obeyed the Gospel? If it is, and I know that many in this room could say yes to that, that's great. You're an encouragement to me because you are a faithful child of God. I appreciate that. But there may be others in the room who have heard that message. They've, they've heard the Gospel message and perhaps the seed hasn't been watered. Well, I know that there are many here in the Bremen congregation who would love to sit, open the Bible, and study with you to water that seed. But if you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, you're willing to repent of your sins, to confess His name before men, to be baptized into Christ where your sins are washed away, where you come in contact with that blood to rise to walk in a new life, in a new life that is faithful. I think of it sometimes as the way Jesus put it in uh, His Sermon on the Mount. That life is on the straight and the narrow path. Here's two paths in life you can walk. The one where you don't care about God is called the Broadway. It leads to destruction. I wouldn't want that for you and you don't want that for me and we don't want that for anyone. What I want for you and what you want for me and what we want for the entire world is to preach to them the gospel that they may obey the gospel, have their sins washed away, and to put their foot on the straight and the narrow path that leads to life. Because there is a God, and it's only in Him that we can live. If we can help you with these things or any other things, we invite you to come as we stand and as we sing. There is beyond the eyes of blue
Dear God, thank you for this beautiful day and all many blessings you give us each and every day. Thank you for this lesson we've heard tonight. May we take what we have heard and apply it to our daily lives. Be with the sick and one that's lost loved one. Take care of their needs. Be with us till we meet again. In Christ's name, amen.